The session is now beginning. Um, good afternoon and welcome to this session of HLF online on a very significant topic today, the state of women in prisons in India, or as the title of the book, to quote the title of the book that we are going to discuss today, Women Incarcerated Narratives from India. While thinking about the title earlier today, I could not help but help being reminded of the seminal work carried out by um, the French philosopher Michel Foucault in his book, Discipline and Punish, who studied the theoretical and social mechanisms underlying incarceration and the nexus between power and dominance over the prisoner. When these elements are transposed into an Indian context and concerns women prisoners, one can only imagine the forms and new meanings taken by each of these terms, given the additional burdens carried by women from society and their own families. So what happens to these women, women prisoners while they are in jail and when they are out of it? These are some of the questions that arise in my mind and to which we will find some answers in the discussion um, that we are going to have today. Leading the conversation are the authors of the book, Mahua Bandopadhyay and Rimpal Mehta. Mahua Bandopadhyay is a social anthropologist studying varied manifestations and experiences of the carceral mesh in contemporary urban society. Her work is situated at the intersections of the sociology of organiza organizations, law, crime and punishment, gender and masculinities. She teaches at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Delhi. Rimpal Mehta is an associate dean and lecturer at the School of Social Sciences, Western Sydney University. She has previously worked at the School of Social Work, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, and School of Women's Studies, Jadapur University, Kolkata. Her research and field engagements broadly focus on women in prison, refugee women, and human trafficking. And she engages with questions of border citizenship and chronology of mobility. In conversation with the authors is someone who needs no introduction, but it gives me great pleasure just the same to introduce her. It is difficult to resume her work in the field of justice and women's empowerment, but in brief, Kalpana Kanabiran is Distinguished Professor, Council for Social Development, New Delhi. A sociologist and legal scholar based in Hyderabad, she works and writes in the area of gender studies, human rights, the law, constitution, indigenous rights, pluralism, among others. She has been a freelance human rights columnist since 2000 and has received many awards and achievements. I'm sure we are all eager to know more about the subject. So without any further ado, let us move into it. I will return at the end of around 45 to 50 minutes to field any questions or comments from the audience. So over to you, Kalpana. Thank you, Uma, and uh, thank you, uh, HLF, for this uh, invitation and for organizing this session at such an opportune time. Uh, before I begin to uh, comment on the book, uh, I would like to request uh, the editors uh, to hold up the copy of the book uh, so that our viewers may actually uh, be able to see it. Thank you. Uh, the, the book, Women Incarcerated uh, Narratives uh, from India, uh, comes, I think, at a very opportune time. Uh, they, in fact, yesterday we were talking about uh, Tista Settelwad getting out on interim bail, and uh, the media has been uh, full of reports of uh, her unfair and unjust arrest. Uh, we also had the uh, uh, of uh, 
Sudha Bharadwaj uh, some uh, time ago. Uh, and then we see the other side of it, which is the remission granted to the men convicted of uh, raping and murdering uh, Belkis Banu and her family. Uh, and uh, the consternation around uh, remission, uh, uh, around early remission, remission as a gift uh, on the 75th year of Indian independence. Uh, and this is what is, uh, is uh, I, I, you know, it's important for us to understand that uh, incarceration, uh, remission, um, unfair detentions, uh, torture in custody, uh, and, and the figurative aspects, not the metaphorical or figurative aspects of incarceration, uh, if we were to look at Bilkis Banu's uh, experience, for instance, uh, required a deep engagement with women, uh, women's experiences in prison. And I found that the uh, discussion uh, in women incarcerated helps us uh, to unpack that uh, you know that that area uh, really well. Um, there aren't too many uh, books of this kind, uh, and and in a long time, this is the first collection of essays uh, from diverse uh, actors uh, and uh, and diverse kinds of testimonies that I have seen. Uh, very briefly, it consists. The book consists of uh, three sections. Uh, the first uh, is called Narratives of Resistance. The second is called Confronting Institutional Spaces. And the third uh, says Humane Prisons, Challenges of Governance. And the 12 essays that make up this collection range from testimonies of women who have survived incarceration and torture to prison administration and reforms therein. Among the interviewers, there are women political prisoners, Naxalite and anti-emergency resistors, uh, and women jailed for IPC or other crimes. And the narratives of these two classes of women, that is the political prisoners and the non-political uh, ones jailed for commission of crime uh, are quite distinct in the insights that they offer into prison life. Uh, also very important in this entire uh, see, you know, the, in, in this entire area is the way in which uh, violence figures um, uh, as torture, as resistance, um, uh, in a routine form and in an exceptional form. I won't take uh, more time than this uh, at this point, except to say uh, thank you, Mowa and Ripple, for putting together this wonderful volume. Uh, I will uh, proceed now to uh, posing questions that uh, help us straddle uh, the different strad uh, the different sections and the different chapters, uh, thematic issues that you might reflect on. Uh, I also understand that some of the the twelve contributors uh, tuned in to YouTube at this time. Uh, if you are a contributor and you would like to intervene in the debate, the way in which you will do it is that you will post your comment in the chat box. And after we have finished with the discussion with the editors, the moderator will get through to you and pose your questions to the audience. So it will be a mediated uh, uh, participation in the conversation that we will be happy to facilitate for you. So my first point then uh, that I uh, would like to pose is the question of, uh, you know, that, that Mungwa raises in her uh, individual essay. Uh, which I think is really relevant to the entire uh, volume, the, the question of ethical loneliness, uh, the, the sense of abandonment and the sense of, uh, you know, the, 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 the experience of, um, uh, you know, extreme or genocidal violence and the loneliness that is attendant on that experience of violence to, uh, I mean, first, of course, uh, applied in uh, by Jill Stoffer in, with reference to uh, survivors of genocidal violence, uh, importantly. But what is very interesting is that MOA actually examines the idea of ethical loneliness in relation to prisoners. So how would you then open this out for women political prisoners, 
for women prisoners under IPC or uh, special criminal offenses. Uh, for others, for instance, prisoners with psychosocial disabilities, we know that Rani Shankar Das has actually spoken about that at quite some length. Uh, and for foreigners, notably Bangladeshi prisoners uh, and detainees who you have actually uh, interviewed and your contributors have um, spoken to in the volume. Um, and, and, and the idea of ethical loneliness for non-binary or queer prisoners uh, did you, uh, you know, are there any such encounters in the book that you would like to speak of, or are there any thoughts that you would like to share? Moa. Um, thank you, uh, Kalpana, for that uh, very, very interesting question. Uh, and before I begin, I'd really like to thank Hyderabad Literary Festival for organizing this and for uh, calling on uh, Professor Kandabaran to actually introduce the book and read the book. And um, I think this the question really reflects um, you know, a close reading uh, of the book. Let me begin uh, by trying to, I know I will not be able to do full justice to the question itself, but I think let me begin by just trying to answer the question. Uh, but before I do that, I think uh, Kalpana, the way you point out, I mean, the uh, idea of ethical loneliness is something that I use in my individual chapter, but what Kalpana is pointing to is also its relevance for the entire book. And it made me think that we could have actually, uh, you know, thought of placing it in the introduction and looking at the entire volume through that idea. Um, so, um, so when I, you know, I, so, I, you know, it would be a more intriguing way of employing that concept and, uh, you know, demonstrating how in effect all these chapters reflect some idea of ethical, uh, some sense of ethical loneliness. Uh, now, Stoffer actually, just to say a few words about the concept, Stoffer actually uses this phrase to describe, uh, as you said, the desolation, isolation, and abandonment that is felt by the marginalized and the unheard, in this case, the victims of torture, and in her case, the victims of torture and, uh, and genocidal war, and et cetera. So, um, so it signifies, uh, for her, it signifies the many ethical breaches on our part, you know, the, those who have the ability to listen and those who hold that kind of power of uh, the potentialities of other lives. So we are, you know, in a sense, we are trusted with this act of uh, listening and the responsibility lies on us to then, which, which is what Stoff is saying, the responsibility lies on us to listen and to hear well. Um, and the ethical lapse occurs when we choose not to hear or when we hear and repress what is actually being said, when we hear and redirect the narrative, God knows that's happening all the time now, or we hear through the lens and framework of our own needs, desires, aspirations, disciplines, ideologies. And Stoffer is arguing that it's everyone's responsibility to hear intently to those accounts of injustice, paying close attention to what is revealed and really hearing it on their own terms, you know, the way it is being, what is, what is being said, and secondly, what is owed to them? So it's when we hear attentively, then we can think about what is it that they want, what is being owed to them. So the mending and healing process then begins with this kind of, uh, this, uh, this act of hearing, and this obligation to listen is the essence of the art and, and the method of representing. And you know, I think this connects to also questions of uh, method. And uh, we hope that the book actually will mark a beginning in this, because as you said, I think all the chapters in some way or the other is trying to reveal uh, a voice uh, that has not been represented or, and, and again, when I say a voice, I don't mean the appropriation of the voice, but in terms of trying to uh, bring it out. So let me give a quick example here for one from one of the later essays in the book, which is from the section on governance, uh, which is by Upneet Lali, where she reviews the material conditions in prisons and their impact on the lives of women prisoners. When uh, Upneet speaks of an architecture of hope, she reminds us that in several attempts by the state to redesign prisons, build new prisons or add facilities to existing prisons, uh, the, the voices of prisoners and staff have never been heard. One of the narratives she uses is that of Shamim Modi, a law professor who narrated her uh, uh, ordeal of arrest and detention in the midst of tribal, tribal protests. She recalled the prison experience by saying, there is often so much abuse that you don't feel human. It can make you forget you ever had rights. These few words I think are extremely powerful. They don't really, really describe the horrors in any detail whatsoever. Yet in these words, left unto themselves, they have the capacity to evoke those horrors for all of us. 
In a similar vein, Uma Chakravarti's <clears throat> essay, this act of listening and drawing out of our responsibility to listen is, is uh, important and is experienced through these words. The cell was shared by another young woman, and this, she's talking about Rajshri, you know, one of the prisoners uh, during the, um, you know, during the Nakshal movement. Uh, the cell was shared by another young woman who had been booked for allegedly stealing her mistress's necklace. The young woman could not understand why Rajshri was being beaten. She had never heard of the Nakshalites or the revolution, but she was shocked to see what the police had done to Rajshri. She would hold Rajshri in her arms each night, lulling her to sleep covering her bruised body with her unstinting love. It was this love, this humanness that, that sustained Rajeshri and made her resolve that come what may, she would not become insane. The police could not break her spirit. She was going to live. She was going to let the torturers, she was not going to let the torturers break her spirit. She would survive the torture and the humiliation to live again. And she did. This is what the state was afraid of, she said, concluding her account. It could not break her spirit or the spirit of others in prison with her. It was that innermost part of their selves that the state could not destroy. This is from Umar's uh, essay. So here what we see is that there are levels of hearing attentively and sensitively uh, which are manifest here. First is Rajeshri's cellmate who hears without Rajeshri speaking or articulating her pains explicitly. Uma's act of listening to Rajeshri's experience of torture and imprisonment and then our act of listening to the multiple layers in these stories. They hold an inexpressible capacity to feel, experience and understand the desolation and dehumanization of prisoner bodies through practices of the state institutions. So these are the narratives which are included in the book and uh, you know, with the hope that the institutions will also begin to hear some of these uh, narratives. Uh, if I have, do I have time to just go, go into one other uh, thing? You have three uh, minutes. Yeah. How many, two, three minutes? Three, three minutes, yeah. Three minutes, okay. So uh, similarly, we can see that there is a powerful and a sensitive rendering, which is to be found in Hermila's essay, again, based on the torture of uh, narratives of torture of women prisoners. And here, again, we, you know, I'm going to focus not on the violence, but on survival. And Sharmila's essay stands testimony to torture, again, not through descriptions of torture, but through the powerful attempts at survival, which is part of the narratives that she uses in her essay. In her words, surviving torture is not premised upon heroism or exemplary strength, as the torturer claims power over the victim's entire being. The point is to reclaim the mind, if not the body, through strategies of survival. The will to live instructs the survivors need to know the unknowable. Sharmila's essay, therefore, marks a sensitive listening of Malaya, Malaya Ghosh's account of torture in Lal Bazar police station. She senses that for Ghosh, memory is one of the key anchors that she uses for sur surviving torture. Rem remembering her life in her natal home transports her to other worlds. But Sharmila reminds us that memory also serves the function of unmasking the torturers in Ghosh's telling. Again, I quote, her reflections help her to recognize how the erosion of rights by the police was hastened under the Congress regime of the 70s. As a political prisoner observer, she used rhetorical questions to unmask the torturers. Within a couple of, this is Malaya Ghosh speaking, within a couple of hours, they've killed millions of living cells in my body. On whose authority, she asks. But why? Am I antisocial or a politico or a regular citizen? What category or classification do I fit in? No matter which category I belong to, where it is said that the state has the power to attack and wound me in various parts of my body. Finally, just two, uh, a couple of words on uh, the, in, the experience of non-binary uh, um, and gender non-conforming persons. And I think this is one of the glaring omissions in the book because we don't have any narratives from non-binary persons. Uh, but I think that... Um, something needs to be said here. Subsequently, uh, I've uh, begun work on trying to, again, mine some of these narratives. There are some reports, there's a CHRI report, uh, and there are a lot of news items which are actually bringing out some of the narratives uh, of uh, trans persons and non-binary persons in prisons. Uh, but uh, in what I'm writing, I think there are two aspects that I want to focus on. One is how the everyday practices of passing through these institutions of the criminal justice system enfold aspects of torture and brutality for trans persons and non-binary persons. 
But secondly, in order to conceptualize these experiences in the prison and police lockup and other sites of confinement, we need to go beyond to uncover the experience of, of unfreedom in other institutions as well, whether it's in the data or in the family or in the educational institution, the workplace accessing you know healthcare in hospitals and clinics so there is a larger sort of narrative of unfreedom and constraint which is a part of these uh, of the lives of non-binary persons so um so i think yes thank you for that uh, you know pointing to uh, also the uh, aspect of uh, looking at the non-binary in the context of ethical uh, loneliness so i think i'll end here and if there are other questions we can take it up later thank you very much uh, for what we uh, my next uh, uh, you know, uh, theme for uh, reflection uh, also draws on uh, the uh, experience of um, incarceration or the documentation around incarceration during the pandemic. Um, for instance, Pratiksha Bakshi and uh, Navsharan Singh uh, had looked at uh, figures of prisoners and release of women prisoners, particularly. Um, and and uh, you know uh, raised uh, questions of um, uh, what are the different ways in which uh, incarceration is gendered uh, and and how does this sit unevenly uh, on women and this is a theme that comes through very strongly in your book uh, I uh, therefore go to a very very uh, uh, you know uh, thickly gendered. Uh, aspect of the discourse, which is the framework of reproductive justice. Uh, several of your essays, uh, as well as in your introduction uh, and in your intervention just now, in your response just now, Mowa, you've spoken about uh, torture, about uh, bodily integrity and autonomy, uh, about uh, also about sexual humiliation not just sexual assault, but sexual humiliation and sexual violence. Uh, and also about family abandonment, um, you know, and, and fam family oppressions. Uh, you know, when I saw the uh, convicts uh, who got uh, remission outside being greeted so warmly by families, I couldn't but help think of the cases of women in, in, in prisons who face a sense of abandonment within, but also face a sense of abandonment when they come out. So the question of family abandonment sits very, very strongly. And there are a couple of narratives that reflect on uh, uh, childlessness, uh, you know, or the, the stigmatizing of barrenness of uh, married women, uh, but also on motherhood. And so I wondered whether you could reflect on the insights that the volume offers uh, through the lens of reproductive justice uh, on the violence of incarceration and its interconnections with specifically gendered analysis of reproductive justice. Rimpel. Thank you. I'll also start by extending my gratitude to Hyderabad Literary Festival for organizing this uh, session and also, thank you very much, Professor Kanabiran, for really bringing out the best from the book and helping us think through all of these ideas. Um, I think what I'll do is I will I will address the question um, about reproductive justice uh, by including the idea of sexual justice as well, because I think that the framework of reproductive justice um, is an extremely important one, especially in the context of the prison. But I think it can also be an essentialist one if we don't see it together with sexual justice. And I and I say this based on um, you know the diversity of perspectives that have emerged not only from the different chapters in the book, but also my experiences of working with women and what they have shared with me, where they have explicitly challenged the idea of uh, you know their reprodu reproductive roles in society. In fact, many have. Um, you know, describe their time in prison as a break from their familial roles, their roles of mothering, and, and more broadly, you know, their, so, uh, their roles of um, social reproduction. Um, having said that, I think uh, in the book, uh, the narratives of uh, Snehalata Reddy and uh, Koteswarama in uh, Uma Chakravarti's chapter really show us the, you know, the pains of separation from their children and the, and the deep impact that it has on their uh, lives and their time in uh, prison. Now, 
in terms of the prison conditions, the practices and availability of resources, the situation of uh, mothers and children in uh, prisons in India, I think uh, Madhurima Dhanuka and Upneet Lali uh, talk about it uh, at great length, specifically with regard to um, the, the international um, uh, guidelines or even at the national level, what's, uh, what's been discussed. So the issue of pregnant women, uh, you know, mothering in prison, mothering of children who are uh, not with them in prison is, is a crucial one when we're thinking of uh, reproductive justice. Um, but in addition to this, I'd also like us to think about uh, women's right to self-determination with regard to aborting a pregnancy while they're in prisons. What, you know, what are the services and options available to them? Who can they speak with um, so that, you know, without any risk of being stigmatized or judged for the decision that they want to make uh, with regard to their pregnancy? And I think there's... Um, also the question of, you know, the construction of, like you said, of, of barrenness and the construction of the idea of motherhood, which are often paved, uh, you know, way for uh, women's pathways to the prison. And uh, we see examples of, of these narratives and these stories in uh, Penelope Tong and uh, Shirin Sadiq's paper um, very, very clearly. And uh, Shirin talks about uh, cases where women have been pushed to, um, you know, taking very drastic measures, even such as uh, sacrificing other people's children to be able to bear their own child, uh, else they would have been abandoned by their marital family. And um, Penelope discusses, you know, the poignant narratives of women who are in prison for killing their children. And their pathways to the prison have been shaped by their experiences of, uh, you know, violence, abandonment uh, by family or e economic deprivation or, or isolation. So, and I think the other question that comes with the reproductive justice framework is, is as we were discussing uh, earlier, is that of, you know, bodily integrity. And I think this is where we really need to tie the idea with our understanding of uh, sexual justice. Uh, because prison space is designed in a way that there is no space for women to express their bodily desires. Um, and the young women from Bangladesh who I met in prison and who have primarily been the women that I have done uh, work with in prisons, they categorically, um, they told me that, you know, they, they had sexual desires as young women and they, this, the world needs to know this. And then you, you let the world know that, that we are here, young women, and we have all of these desires, but no, no way to express or experience uh, these desires. So, so they shared the ways in which, uh, you know, they established relationships with men and women in prison, in court spaces, and, you know, how, how they lived the idea of uh, love. And they labored hard and negotiated, you know, ways to find love in their lives and, you know, express their bodily desires. Um, but these desires also had to be constantly invisibilized in that highly controlled and disciplined and surveilled space of the prison. And, um, you know, Kanupriya's cha chapter also talks about women's desires to get into relationships of love. So all of these narratives of, um, you know, love and desire need to be seen um, in the context of the threat of, you know, sexual humiliation. Um, or there is like always this lurking fear that, you know, what if I express my desires? What if I dress in a particular way? Will that be used as a justification for sexual violence within the prison then? So, and the last point that, you know, I want to make about this is that, um, is that of how we see bodies within institutions, uh, especially bodies which are in transition or bodies which do not fit into gender binaries, menstruating bodies, pregnant bodies, disabled bodies, you know, Dalit bodies, Muslim bodies, tribal bodies, how are we seeing all of these uh, different bodies within that space? And it is absolutely imperative that, you know, we understand the experiences of these different bodies and the gender-based violence that is, you know, inflicted on them based of, on their different intersecting identities. And, and, you know, you're going back to the question of, you know, our ethical uh, responsibility that we were discussing earlier. And I think this will only happen when we, you know, dismantle our understanding of purity and impurity safety and security, because these are the ideas based on which we justify the idea of punishment on some bodies. And as a society, we've come to an agreement that these are some bodies that can be kept in abeyance and they can be in prison. So I think um, 
if you look at it more broadly, it is really the idea of reproductive and sexual justice that need to be looked at together to understand the experiences of these diverse bodies within prison and, and the kind of impact that it has uh, on their life, not only while they're in prison, but but I think it also has an intergenerational impact and it, it, it translates into different aspects of their life within um, you know, the community more broadly. Uh, thanks for that uh, opening out, uh, Rimpel. And I think that uh, it's, it is really important to um, uh, link reproductive justice uh, to sexual justice and, and to also uh, understand that the women uh, that we are speaking about and the women that we are speaking to and that the women that we are representing uh, are not merely in incarceration, but they're also women with, with desires uh, and, and uh, with uh, aspirations uh, for a life uh, that is uh, free in every sense of the term. Uh, I will uh, now move to uh, my next uh, point, which uh, actually you, uh, Rimple, raise uh, quite specifically in the essay that you uh, uh, have written in the volume, which is uh, on looking at uh, space and time uh, and, and uh, examining the, uh, uh, you know, the spatiotemporal frames of prison life. Uh, and uh, you do it rather uh, in, in a rather nuanced form in, in your own essay. Uh, there are also uh, articles in uh, the book. There is one, for instance, on recidivism, and uh, you know. So, I, I, and also when you speak about uh, ethical loneliness, uh, you know, I'm, I'm you, it, how are space and time uh, implicated in uh, the narratives uh, across the volume, and uh, how would you? Uh, kind of uh, pose the question of uh, space and time, would, would it be, and, and importantly, the question of spatial justice, especially if you are uh, speaking of mistreatment outside and mistreatment in prison, uh, and you're speaking of uh, solidarities or law, lack of solidarities outside, but also the shaping of solidarities in prison. Uh, so you're having, you know, you have hostility and solidarity, the interplay between the two. Um, and uh, so I was wondering how you would pose the question of time and space. Uh, would it, you know, would it be linear? Uh, do you have an idea or uh, do you have ideas on the cyclicity of, of time in these women's lives? Uh, and how would you open that out? Yeah. Thanks, Kalpana. I think like just to start with the idea of spatial and temporal justice um, within this prison space almost um, sounds ironical, right? Because the prison space and time are designed in, in a way to bring a person's life to a standstill, literally. And um, the prisoners don't have control over the space that is allocated to them in the prison, nor do they have a say in how they're going to organize the time while they're in prison. While um, this is one end of the spectrum, the other is that that little space and the abundance of time is actually all that the prisoners have while they're in prison. Um, and this abundance of time can often also be very disorienting because it can lead to a sense of timelessness where the pre-prison life and the life after prison always, almost move out of focus. It's something that they, they sometimes almost lose uh, memory of, like what was my life before and you know what am I going to do after? That's, that's something that I'm not even being able to imagine because of, of where I am right now. And I think um, the way to understand space and time in prison is, is really for me how the prisoners experience it and how they, they resist the mundane but yet violent design of the prison space uh, time. Um, and um, so as, as under trials, the prisoners begin to live, uh, you know, from one court date to another in the hope that, you know, the visit to the court will change the trajectory of the case, you know, and that, that maybe, you know, the next day they would be out. Or once convicted, they start counting the dates to their release. So the way time is understood by 
an under trial prisoner uh, and those who are convicted is different because uh, you know convicted prisoners uh, once they're convicted prisoners have access to you know some programs or you know labor within the prison which are denied to the under trial uh, prisoners so there is so in that way there is this linear aspect to time in how the time is organized for a particular prisoner while they are in prison but like you said there is there's a cyclical aspect for um time as well and as you rightly pointed out in the chapter by mangala and um, and vijay where they're talking about uh, women recidivists um and how women recidivists use their time in prison to make connections with women who are maybe maybe gang leaders and who may provide them with you know an opportunity for earning um, a livelihood once they are out of uh, prison so for some of these women prison time does not end with the completion of a sentence it follows them outside the prison and you know creates that whole cycle of vulnerability which again paves their way um, you know to the prison so another way i mean so so there is this linear understanding of time and there's this cycl cyclical understanding of time but um, another way in which i've seen that you know uh, the women that i spoke with were making meaning of time in prison was through their uh, bodily experiences so you know referring to uh, you know particular incidents that happened in a prison based on their menstrual cycle or the change in the seasons and and not all of it was in terms of you know the roman calendar uh, and in terms of dates exact dates um and and i think uh, one of the ways in which they were coping with time and, and i absolutely found the construction of um, time through rumors and the creative use of rumors absolutely fascinating uh, because the the way women were using the rumors um, or even creating and passing on rumors within prison to be able to cope with prison time uh, because it gave, gave them that sense that you know and hope that okay something's going to change or, or maybe you know the politicians are talking about us prisoners and in the case of the bangladeshi women they would say that oh we just heard that you know this is there's going to be a truck and we're all going to be sent back and and it was the same rumor that was going around and it almost you know was made out in a way that um, you know the the, the political uh, discussion is literally around us you know so i think um, those are various ways in which were, women were experiencing space and time within the prison and i think uh, the other thing that um, with, that comes out very clearly in uma chakravarti's chapter is uh, how space and time in prison is used to build uh, solidarities of different kinds um in which again i i, I see that uh, in kanupriya's chapter i see that in in my work as well how um women come together to uh, you know for a common cause uh, or to you know build friendships and solidarities of different kinds and um, the narrative of uh, rajshita gupta minakshi sen and uh, you know kalpana bandopadhyay in uma's chapter show how solidarities are utilized within prison space as and and make that space as a site of protest um and you know weave relationships with each other which help them cope in prison and also retain a sense of self and you know we were talking about that spirit so that the spirit is not destroyed and uh, to sort of get that sense of sustenance uh, while in prison and um, just do I have I have a couple of more minutes okay um uh, and i think the gender segregation of uh, prison spaces has just been discussed in almost every chapter um, in the book and especially sadaf and, and my chapter as you pointed out and uh, the women's prison are often like a ward within the larger uh, prison you know which has essentially been designed for uh, men and uh, like sadaf talks in her chapter about uh, you know prisons where women occupy the topmost floor of a building while the rest of the floors are occupied by men and due to the rules around gender segregation this means that women are not allowed to access you know different parts of the uh, prison space apart from their floor or just their ward so spaces are therefore uh, not only segregated but they are also uh, gendered in terms of how they are used and i think the use of space um, is not only gendered but it intersects with caste and uh, class uh, in many many ways uh but there are also apart from the use of the space and the construction of the space it's also how bodies are expected to perform in that space and the gendered expectations uh, around how 
how you dress. And uh, Sadaf actually it, it refers to, to a, a, an imagery in her chapter where she says that women were going to collect uh, food and um, they didn't have an urna or a dupatta and they were asked to get one. And they immediately uh, cover their breasts with, with either a bowl or a plate. Um, and um, so these, you know, these ways in which their women are expected to perform their gendered identity and to adhere to the norms of dressing based on, uh, you know, what is considered honorable and what is not. So I, I'll just close with saying that uh, we really need to think about, you know, this idea of um, spatial justice and how violence exists in different spaces uh, that women inhabit outside the prison. And some of this Mahua was discussing when she was talking about ethical loneliness. Um, because the continuity of violence in the different spaces across uh, women's lives often lead women to say that pr prison is probably a safer space for me to be in. And uh, we need to address questions of you know, women's experiences of exclusion, social isolation, violence across these different spaces, as well as the inequities and in access to these uh, spaces. So, you know, like for the for the law abiding and the law making citizen, the idea of security is ensured through the creation of the prison. Um, but all of these women and their narratives in the book really talk about how women navigate the idea of security very differently from for them, the search for security, whether it's uh, spatial, economic, cultural, religious, it's a constant one. And um, and sometimes it's also across borders, as we have seen in the narratives of the Bangladeshi women in Indian prisons. Sure. Yeah. Um, thanks, uh, Rimple. I uh, will now move uh, to my uh, final uh, point, um, which is on the question of method. Uh, it's not easy to study uh, women uh, in systems uh, or institutions of incarceration across the range. Uh, and in, in your book, uh, you have uh, essays that have used oral history, uh, ethnography, you've used long interviews. Uh, there's interestingly also the use of theater, um, both within prison and prison theater traveling out of the prison. So talk of the time and space dimension there, uh, theater and performance. And this, uh, you know, uh, makes me raise uh, a question. What are the methodological limitations and possibilities uh, that you might reflect on in looking at incarcerated gender, uh, particularly incarcerated women in this case? Uh, moving performance and perform, uh, performativity beyond prison theater to the enactment of testimony and solidarity, if you like. So there is performance uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the performance of various, um, uh, various kinds of uh, uh, performance with various kinds of meanings. So if theater is liberating, uh, so is solidarity. Uh, and there is, you know, there are very moving, um, you know, uh, accounts of the uh, development and growth of solidarities between unknown prisoners within uh, the prisons that you talk about. And since your essays do speak about the ways in which uh, representations uh, move beyond the personal and of the ways in which solidarities actually enable speech and life, uh, a sense of purpose. Uh, even if one might say that within walls. Uh, I was wondering if uh, one of you could reflect uh, on the question of method. Uh, and this will be uh, my last question in this discussion. Um, thank you, Kalpana. If I may, uh, Rimple, if you allow me to respond to this, and if you have something to say, you can, I think, add. Uh, but um, very quickly, uh, let me make some observations. One is, I think you talk about methodological limitations. Uh, you know, the overwhelming limitation is one of access. And we can yes. think of access in terms of physical as well as social, because it is one thing to access, you know, to actually have access to a prison uh, and to, a, you know, and then to to actually have access to speak, to be able to speak freely. 
Um, I think most of us who have done any kind of research on prisons, you know, you're always, you know, there is always somebody tagging along with you to hear what you are, what is being said, to hear what is being discussed. And uh, so in a sense, a large part of the method is about subversion. Um, and, you know, is about learning to subvert. And I think that um, when you think about performance, then I think this is the performance that we do as um, in terms of the method. And but we learn this interestingly from the narratives of prisoners. Uh, we learn this because of what prisoners are doing and, and their survival strategies. Um, so, so yes, as, as you rightly point, point out, subversion and solidarities, building solidarities are the key to finding the prison and understanding the prison. Uh, and uh, we could think of them as um, uh, very sort of uh, specifically in terms of, of how we rework, if I think of ethnography, I can think of it as how I rework the method to enable uh, um, uh, you know, access. Uh, but I think what is also interesting is, you know, that we are writing, we, we, we are using, and that's why, you know, we put the title as narratives, because in academia, as well as outside, uh, and especially in social science disciplines, the use of narratives, testimony, performativity, uh, involved in storytelling, all of this is marked with tremendous distrust. And, you know, they're, they're written with vexed questions of, uh, you know, a uh, truth and validity, you know, so questions like, well, how will you do comparative studies? How would you generalize on the basis of just one prison on the basis of one narrative and so on? These are questions we encounter all the time. And on the face of it, what it does is that it undermines the wealth of data and information that is present even in this one narrative, you know, so um, uh, and and uh, so, in addition, when we begin to say that, if we begin to say that it's performative, which is what, what you know you're pointing to, and I fully agree with you, uh, I think that the you know uh, in terms of um, in terms of the larger validity of what we have done, really sort of in some senses falls through for many people. Um, you know, if I just if I think about you know what happened with Stan Swami, um, you know. It, it, you know, and the denial of this kind of straw, the denial of books, it, it's this kind of, what are you saying? You're saying that even a straw cannot pass through. Mm -hmm. So how do I even dare ask for permission to go to the prison? You know, I dare not, because if a straw cannot go, surely I cannot. So I think that, uh, but on the other hand, when we think of these narratives, testimony and ethnography, uh, I think they have the, they have the potential to challenge dominant ways of seeing. Uh, and when I say dominant ways of thing, of course, I'm referring to the status perceptions and views of what the prison is and what the prison should be. Uh, but I think they also uh, help us to re-examine how existing discourses are being re are being appropriated. I mean, take, for example, the perspective of human rights. I think, you know, from a status point of view, it is a discourse that is con constantly appropriated to pr present the yeah. prison in a particular light. Uh, yes. So I think narratives have the power to disrupt that. And when you say performative, performativity of storytelling, both the performativity of the storyteller, because when we go into prisons, uh, I hope, you know, we, we are trying to tell the story. We are trying to tell the story of a prison. We are trying to tell a story about why we want to research the prison. Um, so, so all of this becomes part of um, actually disrupting what is going on with regard to the prison and to these sites of confinement and the ways in which they are invisibilized. So every time a researcher goes into a prison, um, actually we have managed to do that, you know, a narrative has managed to do the work of convincing. Uh, and I think that itself can be uh, very powerful. Um, and then finally, I think this issue of, well, what can these narratives, you know, this, how, how, what can uh, solidarities and the narratives of solidarity tell us about uh, both about the prison as well as about our method. I think that is uh, really a, an interesting question. I don't think that has been explored uh, very well in our wall in our book. Uh, and your questions make me think that there should have been another chapter on method, you know, which actually, uh, you know, fundamentally dealt with the method that. And again, so you, if you look at the book, it's 
uh, they all rely on a mix of different kinds of things, right? Testimony, which we are, you know, we are sort of grabbing at little news reports, grabbing at small interviews, uh, you know, your first person account. So all of this is put together. So it's a kind of bricolage. The book itself is a kind of uses that uh, bricolage to put across, uh, you know, what, what the prison represents. And I think whenever we study the prison, it has to be this. It has to be a piecing together from various kinds of fragments. So when you begin to ask questions of, well, is this valid and is this going to work? I think it it just dismantles uh, the kind of work that is necessary to do, to build, to make this, to present this kind of story. Uh, I'll end here, but maybe Rimple has something to add. Rimple, just, would you like but, to add to that? Yeah, just very briefly. Um, yeah. That I think what is integral to um, the methods of working in prison is the ability and the openness to take risks, because I think there is so much risk involved in uh, you going in, in terms of your own bodily integrity, your safety, not only while you're in the prison, but what you write later, what you're doing outside. And of course, the risks that it involves, like anything that you do, how is that going to impact the, the women after you leave the prison? So now in a very risk averse world where the narrative of risk is emerging in a, in a particular kind of way, I think there is no way you can work within a prison without an, a willingness to you know, take that risk on. Yeah, um, thank you. I think uh, you know, it's been uh, a, re a really uh, illuminating uh, discussion. And um, you know, I mean, I, I think also the questions, uh, I mean, the discussions around the questions and, and the reflection that we've managed to uh, have today uh, have, uh, for me, uh, uh, opened out uh, pathways to extend your work further. So in a sense, there's not very much uh, before you uh, wrote this book or before you put this book, book together. And uh, there is uh, a lot uh, that this book opens out pathways to. So in that sense, I think uh, this has been, um, you know, a really very, very, uh, uh, you know, a, a productive um, endeavor. Uh, and congratulations. I think, I think it's been a great job. And thank you very much. Over to you, Uma. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Mahua Rimple, Professor Kalpana. Thank you so much for such a thought-provoking and profound discussion on the state of women, but also I think beyond that, we have looked at how the prison itself uh, uh, treats as a structure, treats the, uh, the people who are incarcerated. And you have discussed uh, topics like ethical loneliness and reproductive justice, and gendered spaces, and also through all this, uh, the emergence of uh, solidarity. And uh, what I liked also was the explanation of your methodology, I mean, um, the um, one cannot deny that a qualitative approach of research uh, really brings out a lot of nuances uh, of the system which exists, which is really difficult to bring out in a, uh, you know, prosaic, um, quantitative <laughs> kind of thing. And what really strikes me was also that the resilience, I think, which has come across, uh, which have been shown by these women, uh, who have undergone torture, who have, uh, you know, who have no one to talk to, um, the lack of space, the, the loss of the sense of time, which I think is really, um, you know, very, I mean, where do they draw these resources from? So is it out of desperation? Is it, uh, is there any kind of support structure around them, which allows them to, uh, you know, look at, focus on the light at the end of the tunnel? Is there any response you might have to that or? Uh, well, that's a, that's a question for a brief response from either of you. Uh, yeah. 
I can. I think uh, what it shows us is really the inability of the institutions to break spirits of these women. I think that's what it shows us because in 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 the circumstances where they have no familial support, very very li little support from any kind of relationships outside, it's the relationships that they build within prison which help them sustain themselves. So so those are the two things that you know that the the spirit to move on and whether we go in as researchers or you know whether we go as a social workers they continue to you know fight that fight and resist so i think it's it's really the spirit and the kind of solidarities that they build in within prison i think mm. yeah. would you like to add to that Mahua, or yeah yeah I okay think I yeah. yeah okay so we have a um, few questions and comments from the audience which i will just uh, read out so Rupa Sharma asks, are there any hierarchies created among prisoners and along what lines? Do we see more solidarity among these women prisoners in ways we would not see outside the prison? I mean, uh, either of you could take that question. Uh, yeah, I can, I can respond to that. Uh, yes, I think uh, there are several kinds of uh, hierarchies that we will, uh, in, that we see in prisons. I mean, among, if I just talk about the women prisoners, um, you know, some of it could be along the lines of crime and, you know, our present presentation of solidarities and resilience does not mean that there is no conflict and that that it's, it's a, you know, it's a space that is all harmonious. Um, there is tremendous conflict among different groups of prisoners. Some of this, as I said, could be on the basis of hierarchies, which are along the lines of the kinds of crime they have been accused of or convicted of, and they're there for. Uh, some, solid, some of the hierarchies are uh, continue, continued hierarchies from uh, society itself in terms of the caste class uh, kind of hierarchies, and those are there. Um, there are, again, also, there could be region and regional and religious um, uh, religion-based hierarchies which exist, uh, uh, you know, within the prison. And I think there is a kind, I mean, again, I think I'm drawing on uh, the idea of intersectionality to kind of uh, help help us see how, in any situation, how those hierarchies uh, may play out. Um, so, you know, and, and further, I think what's important to note is that no prison is the same. So, you know, when you think of prisons in India, I mean, I've said, we have said narratives from India, uh, but there is great variation, you know, so if I look at a prison in Punjab, and I look at one in Bihar, uh, if you think of the kind of hierarchies and their impact on women's lives within the prison and how they are able to rework uh, some of these aspects, it, they would be very different. Uh, of course, uh, the other sort of very significant thing is the kind of access that you have to money. Uh, outside the prison will definitely, you know, impact your ability to negotiate uh, your life uh, within prison. I think uh, maybe Rempel needs would like to add something to that. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have another question from Vijay Kumar. Um, he says uh, he asks: Male prison diaries are quite an established genre in literary and social studies. Do we have any Indian prison diaries by women? Um, yeah, several. Uh, there are several, uh, and and some very new ones as well, which are uh, which are coming up. And I also know that some of the uh, you know uh, some of the women prisoners who have been to prison recently uh, are in the process of uh, writing their diaries. One of the oldest ones is you know uh, I forget the name, but uh, Mary Tyler. Um, yeah. Uh, my years in an Indian prison, uh, but there are several, yeah. uh, and you know, oh, actually, uh, uh, Uma's uh, uh, paper deals with very interestingly uh, with one such uh, diary, and um, uh, you know, and tries to bring out uh, from again from the fragments that uh, you know uh, that were being written what life in prison was like. Uh, so, if male prison diaries is is a thing, so is women prisoners' uh, diaries. Yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, Rimple, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think um, it, the male prison diaries is a thing like ev everything that is masculine becomes a thing. And 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 I, Uma talks about this in her chapter uh, where she talks about the film Bandini and uh, why it's so difficult for um, Hindi films to have uh, the hero, uh, you know, as a fem the female figure as the hero and how... Uh, uh, Nutan just remains as you know the the woman prisoner in that film, uh, and and she, she there are instances of uh, you know women's diaries that she talks about in her chapter, and and some of them are really in fragments which have probably been completed later, uh, but 
specifically, you know, what Snehla Taredi writes when she's in prison. And it's the fragments that, you know, Uma then um, is also analyzing in her chapter. So there are various instances of that. Okay. Um, we have a last question by Ramakrishna Dulam. What are the mechanisms available in prisons for the mental health of women prisoners as their mental health is affected greatly on a negative spiral? That was the question. Do you want? Do you to want to, would you like to take that? Um, yeah, I can just say that it, it's a good question, and I think mental health is something that uh, even as, as as a society outside prison, we are still uh, grappling with. And um, as far as I know, and when I did fieldwork and whatever the latest information I have, that there is almost little to no mental health services available within the prison, and. Uh, Again, it's ironical because of the deep impact that the prison safe space itself has on people who are within that space. Um, so I would say, no, this is not something that is taken into consideration or is it even anywhere in the priority list of what should be offered to prisoners. For many either, um, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, there is, uh, you know, in many prisons, again, I'm just talking from my field was experience there, there in, in Bengal, definitely there was the uh, post of the welfare officer. So the understanding was that the welfare officer, who would be somebody who is trained in social work discipline and so on, would have the capacity to actually address some of the mental health needs of the prisoners. Uh, but, you know, in, in practice, actually, you know, the welfare officer was rarely around and, uh, you know, was not somebody essentially trained to uh, really assess and understand the mental health needs. So as Rimple says, there is actually very little uh, thinking that is uh, that is there. And, you know, in the late 90s, when I did field work in, in Kolkata, they, they still had what is called the non-criminal lunatic ward. Of course, that is not there anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, so all kinds of women would actually be put in that ward, including women uh, who were accused and put in the main female ward. Uh, and if they behaved slightly differently, they would just be transferred to uh, the NCL ward. So the NCL ward became also the space for another kind of disciplining uh, of women prisoners and their bodies and their minds and so on. So And punishment. Yeah. 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 And, and I think this is an area that really, really needs a lot of work because the narratives of the women inform us about the trauma, the multiple trauma that they go through. Mm -hmm. So we definitely need to have a trauma-informed approach. And just the idea of having a welfare officer with a psycho broadly psychosocial approach is probably not going to help these women get out of the cycle of incarceration. Uh, there's just another question which has come up by Indu Kumari. Uh, this is a question for both of you. What do you think about the abolition movement of prisons we see in the West? I can, I can begin to respond to that. I think, um, uh, you know, I think that there is a kind of uh, castral culture which uh, we have now where um, in some senses you don't need the prison to discipline and punish and so on. And that's very, very dangerous because some of the kinds of torture and uh, violence and brutality that we would think would happen only in prisons actually now happens on our streets and, uh, you know, in our homes and in all kinds of private and other public spaces. Um, so, so in that sort of context, I think, uh, you know, there is great value uh, to the abolitionist project. However, I think that, um, uh, you know, historically and regionally, I think there are certain kinds of specificities that we need to address. I think, you know, the West and the movement towards abolitionism has a particular kind of history. And uh, to import that in the Indian context would be very, very, I, I would consider that to be very, very problematic. Just as we have imported ideas of, you know, the well-ordered Western prison, the prison as a total institution, we have imported those ideas. And, um, you know, what we see in prison is totally, uh, totally, totally different. So I think that even if there is a support for abolitionism as a project, I think we need to get there ourselves rather than sort of have this kind of import. So I think that, you know, we need to begin to first think about what those institutions are, uh, understand what they're doing before we even begin to think about 
uh, uh, abolition. So I think that there has to be a particular kind of trajectory through which our thoughts and our understanding needs to go through uh, in order to arrive at some, I don't know whether it will be abolitionism or something else, but uh, yeah. And, and, and what that should that would do is also then address not just you can't, you can't think about reform without actually thinking about the outside. And, and you know, recently I had access to do field work in prisons in Punjab. And it was so interesting that so many, and we spoke only to the male prisoners, we had access to the male prison, we spoke only to male prisoners, and they were all talking about very, very interestingly, in very sort of deeply sociological ways about how, uh, you know, the, about the linkages between prison and society, you know, so talking about drugs in Punjab, talking about, uh, you know, property and property crime and what they were in for. So I think that uh, for the ordinary prisoner, often with very little education, the prison becomes a space where it offers them the potential to for this kind of opening up and for this kind of analytical uh, lens. And I think we need to make use of that analytical lens to then see what we are doing with prisons and uh, these ideas of reform and shifts from prisons to something else. Uh, but, you know, I think that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm taking more time, but I think this aspect of like, like policing and surveillance and the kind of policing and surveillance that is going on, which is not just in certain kinds of institutions, but all over, that definitely needs some ideas from the abolitionist project to come in and to, you know, for us to rethink what we are, what we are doing here, where, where is, you know, how much money are we spending on policing and surveillance? The other day, somebody told me in a hostel with 340 rooms, there are 320 cameras just in the corridors, you know, so, so what are we doing, uh, you know, and, and to what end? I think, uh, I think this is a very important question. Um, before uh, maybe Rimpal answers, Indu Kumari goes on. She's asking a few more questions, so I'll just read out the whole thing. So she continues, can we imagine such a kind of moment in our country, premising on the failure of these institutions? I think you just answered that. Uh -huh. um, we see how marginalized communities, be it Muslims or Dalit or Adivasis, have been the target to a large extent. Also thinking of how the convicts of Bilkis were released, the justice given stands itself in question now. So those are her comments. I'll just add a few thoughts. Um, I think abolition of any spaces of incarceration is what we should aspire for. I mean, thinking that, you know, I was listening to what Kalpana was saying about this book, you know, being one of its kind, there haven't been too many as examples. And I'm like, we're in 2022. So what have we done, even in terms of our responsibility and, you know, going back to the question of ethical loneliness, like how have we also contributed in ways um, that has invisibilized the lives of uh, people in prison and uh, specifically women in prison. Um, so I think that that is a goal. And I, we do want a society which is um, not putting people behind bars. And that's what I was saying earlier that, you know, we, the idea of security comes from just putting someone behind those bars. But then as, as, as Penelope uh, points out in her book, in, the, in her chapter in the book, and where do we go from here? How do we look at the idea of, you know, reform? Is this really about reform or what's happening to people once they go out into the communities? Um, so we are, as Mahua pointed out, we are ready to like invest all of that money. We are ready to, uh, you know, not create spaces of justice because we are holding on to an idea of punishment. Unless we rupture the idea of punishment, we are not going to be able to move towards a better idea of justice. And I think that for me is integral. And I really do hope that in a few years, we don't have to have this panel discussion and that we don't have to write a book, you know, um, about all of these issues, which just seems like, you know, if you just celebrated the 75th uh, independence uh, year and yeah, so yeah, abolition is the goal, I guess. And we should all have that goal. Yeah. So, um, we have come to the end of the questions. Uh, we can continue actually this conversation. It is so rich and there are so many um, thought provoking angles to it that I think the more we think about it, the more I think about it, the more questions come to mind. But uh, I think we have reached the end of this format. So I would like to thank you very much, Mahua, Rimpal, Professor Kalpana for this very, very thought provoking discussion. I hope that such books, you know, you said, why do we have to write this book? But I wish, I hope that more such narratives would come out 
and more such stories are brought to the public and probably go into policy making because ultimately i guess that's where uh, we should be looking at, at how to concretely improve um, the lives of uh, these prisoners be it women or men so on behalf of hlf i thank all of you for this thought provoking discussion and um, yeah okay kinara also says thank you mahua rimpal kalpana for an interesting session so yeah goodbye good evening thank you thank you and thanks to all the listeners and yeah. those who asked the questions yeah thank you, thank you.